Let's go ahead and begin with a prayer. Our loving, merciful Father, we come to you this morning thanking you for this chance that we have to assemble, to worship you, to praise you, that, to learn a portion of your word. We ask that we would focus on these things this morning, that we'd set aside any worldly distractions, any, any other things that we might focus our attention completely on you. We ask that as we sing to you, as we speak to you in prayer, as we observe the memorial of your son's death, that we do so with, with honest and upright hearts, that we would do it in a way that would, that would be in accordance with what you'd intended. We ask that we would consider one another, that you'd guide us and help us as we do that for, for those of us who are here, for those who aren't, for, for whatever reason, health or hardship or travel, or, or even by choice, that we would consider one another to, to encourage each other to live that faithful life, that we would have that expectation of salvation and an eternity in heaven with you. We're grateful for the son that you sent for us, for his teaching, for his example, and especially for his sacrifice for us, that we have this relationship with you because he paid the price that we'd incurred. We ask that you would help us to be more like him through our, our thoughts and our deeds, that we would be willing to give of ourselves for you like he did. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.
morning. We are here gathering now around the table to remember the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. And I want to read from a few passages, one being um, Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. It says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophet and has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of his majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Then I'd like to read um, John 3.16. Most of you have memorized. <clears throat> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then the last, uh, I would like to read Luke 22. And... Um, verses 14 through 23. When the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desire to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which was given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is shed for you. So we read a, a few scriptures um, about who Jesus is, how much power he actually had. Um, I can't think of anything more powerful than being able to speak and then it exists. And this same God who was um, an express image of God the Father uh, who gave his son, and then he spoke these words to us that we are to remember his death, burial, and resurrection. And the same power that created the world um, is now asking us to remember that death, burial, and resurrection and um, we're going to do that now as we uh, offer thanks for the fruit of the vine. I mean, the uh, bread. Our beloved God and Father, we are so very thankful for Christ, the fact that he loved us and was willing to give himself for us, that he being God um, is so impressive to us that um, he would sacrifice himself for us. We pray as we partake of this bread that we remember that sacrifice and we do it in a way that's acceptable to you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. kind and gracious God for your son we're so very thankful for his willingness to offer his blood on our behalf that we might have remission of sins the cost of it which was his blood we pray that we would be impressed by that and be thankful for his offering and we are so so very thankful for that and we pray as we partake of this cup and remember that blood that we do it in a way that pleases you this is our prayer in Jesus name amen
uh, supplement number 33, Lord I Believe. Good morning, everybody. Good to see all of you and uh, look at the camera for all of you at home. But uh, I want to continue on what I started talking about last week, which I titled really um, The Theory of Everything, something I've been thinking about for quite a few years. And, and really the background of it is my observation of just the church, churches I've been a part of for the last 35 years um, or so, and, and then also during that time preaching for 25 or so, um, and then also my study really of Christian history. Um, what I've observed is that, you know, a lot of different things, but in essence, I, I kind of realized this week that what I have realized is probably what Jesus was speaking about in the, in the parable of the sower. When he talks about the sower going out and sowing the seed. And on one of the people that the seed falls upon, the gospel, it really doesn't have anything to do with it. It rejects it outright. But three quarters of people who really hear the gospel have some response to it. It sounds good, it sounds appealing, it sounds like something they would want. But two-thirds, or, or yeah, two-thirds of those who respond, either last a very short time and, and are gone, because they never have any real roots, they never really get it, they never have any real understanding of the gospel, or that their temptations and desires so overwhelm the teachings of what they should and shouldn't do that they never really bear the fruit that God wants us to bear. To have love and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and mercy. Have those things dominate in our life. And so, I guess I realized this week that what I've been looking at and trying to explain or understand in my own mind and what has brought me to kind of creating um, this study, I guess, this outline, this theory of everything, as I talked about it last week, it really is what he was talking about, that too many Christians never really get the purpose of the message of God to them. And so I think a lot of Christians sometimes fall into the trap of what they want is the church. They want camaraderie, they want other people, they want, you know, they want, they want family and friends and, and acquaintances. And I remember when I was, before I was a Christian, my brother telling me, you, you, go to churches to try and find a wife. I'm like, I'm not going to churches to try to find a wife. If I don't want to go there, I don't want to find somebody who wants to go there. And so when I became a Christian, it made a whole lot of sense to find a, a wife from somebody who also wants to go to church. But it didn't make a lot of sense to me to find a wife that devoted to church when I wasn't devoted to church. Um, I guess I understood something beforehand. <laughs> that, uh, I, I understood better later. But um, my, the concepts that I'm talking about is an answer to what I have seen kind of historically. Even going back into the second, third centuries, you find that Christianity really devolved into a lot of arguing, a lot of debating, and a lot of taking up sides. And now there were certainly some heresies, there were some heretics teaching things that were contrary to the Word of God, and they had to be confronted. And so not all of that was inappropriate, but what you find in the last 2,000 years, in my opinion, is that Christians, human beings have a tendency to become issue Christians, to become a type of Christian, that 
one passage or one thing means more to them than everything else, and that really dominates all of their thoughts and thinking. And I find that to be something that prevents growth. It's not uncommon to come to God to find the Scriptures, read the Scriptures, and find a verse that really hits you where you're at at the time. And you're like, wow, this is what I needed right now. But if that's the passage, the only passage you really think about, and the one that dominates all your life forever, are you really growing? Are you really evolving and conforming and transforming into the image of His Son? And that's what I have seen a lot of. And so my, my study, and my attempt to create this study um, has been trying to answer that. And so I'm going to just highlight what I talked about last week, this theory of everything, um, this framework. And I gave you a couple examples last week, but also think about it this way. All of us learn from the time we were first come in, we're born into the world, and probably even before we're actually born, we begin to actually have sensory input. We don't know what to do with it. When we're born into the world, we get all kinds of sensory input. We learn. We're told things. We don't understand what people are saying. We don't know what they're talking about, but we hear it, right? We see things. But we really don't know what to do with all the information coming into our brain. And so we create frameworks. We create systems of thought that we kind of start categorizing all of the information that we get, whether it's from our own senses, whether it's from things people tell us or teach us, or ex our own experience, and we begin to categorize them and to try and make sense of all the world around us. And very often, that leads to information that doesn't fit anywhere. And what do we do with it? We actually do the same thing scientists do with it. We throw it away. Now, it's unfortunate that science that does this, but sometimes science does it because a study is bad. And so there's just information that's kind of an outlier. And you go, what do you do with this outlier? I don't know. It doesn't fit any of the norms. It doesn't fit any of the parameters of anything I understand. And so I go, okay, I'll just ignore it. How much information have you ignored in your life? How many passages in Scripture have you read and not really understood and gone, well, I guess that's okay. Right? We've all done it. We've all, that's just because we don't know what to do with it. And so we can't do anything with it until we learn more, until we grow more. And so I, I love the quote from Einstein. where He said, I want to know how God created this world. When he was talking to a young physics student in 1925, he said, I'm not interested in this or that phenomenon. He said, and what he was talking about is, I'm not interested in the details of this study or that study. And it reminded me of, of people who take the Bible and become all consumed with some passage or another. And as opposed to the whole. What's the point of the whole thing? And so, he said, in the spectrum of this or that, he said, I'm not interested in just the, the spectrum of this or that element. I want to know his thoughts. The rest are just details. And I thought the scripture, in many ways, it gives us his thoughts. Not in many ways, it is. It are the, they are the thoughts of God delivered through the centuries for us. For us to understand God's purpose. We don't have to look into physics to know God's purpose. We don't have to look into biology to know God's purpose. In fact, I would suggest to you those things won't answer the great purpose of God. Because the great purpose of God is not physical, it is spiritual. And so, I think, and I have for about 10 years or so, I have realized, so, so I'd been a Christian for, I don't know, 25 years. I'd been preaching for 15 um, or so. And just in the last 10, I began to realize as I would study passages or I would study a thought or I would study a word or a concept and I would trans I'd go through it, I kept finding myself in a big circle. I kept coming back to stuff that I start where I started. 
because I began to realize it all connects. I used to, you know, it's like, oh, you know, okay, let's talk about the tongue. Let's talk about, you know, how you speak. Let's talk about how you do this or how you do that. And the Bible has lots of answers for all those things. And it's a good thing because if I had to understand everything from the time I'm a babe in Christ, I'd be confused and I'd be lost. And so it's really good that I can learn little bits and pieces, just like babies do, right? But at some point, we expect a baby to grow up and put into practice some of the things they've been taught. Why were they told, have a regular bedtime? Why were they told to brush their teeth in the morning and in the evening? Why were they told, you know, to do all of the things that their parents told them to do? There were reasons for all of those things. There were reasons for those. The idea is to grow up and understand the reasons and to practice the good behavior because you now understand the reason for it. You were taught what to do, but then later on you understood its importance. And I think that's the same way with Scripture. Very often, we are taught what to do, much like the Old Testament was a tutor to try and bring people to the understanding of Christ to help to give them commandments, simple things. Do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. Lots of do's, lots of do nots. But after the fact, you can go, oh, that's why I shouldn't do that. That's why I should do that. Because I'm trying to love God and love my neighbor. And so, we grow up in the Scriptures and in spiritual ways just like we grow up in this world, in a physical way. We get lots of information and then we have to, at some point, figure out its grand reason, its grand purpose. And so I think it all comes down to these three things. And you might disagree, and you might, you might see it differently, and that's okay. This is just kind of my perspective of it. And this perspective is only a couple weeks old. (laughs) I started a few years ago, and I have gone through a whole bunch of iterations to this iteration. By the way, I have, I didn't bring them out. I, I actually have like 25 copies of my outline of this theory of mine. Um, and it's, you'll see it's a lot of detail in this first point. I uh, believe I have 13 points under it. Um, and so you'll see my, 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 my high end outline has got a lot of things in it and I'm going to probably talk about a lot more depth to a lot of it, but I have it in case you would like to read through it. You'd like to study through it. I've made a bunch of copies. I think I have them in the copier, just sitting in the copier at the moment, but fellowship, I think if you were to kind of take everything into one thing, God wants to be united with us. We are his offspring, and he wants to be our God, and he wants us, all human beings, to be his people. And he wants that, like a father wants that with his child, or a mother wants that with her child. And not just when they're little. When they're little, it's easy, right? They need you. You, you provide for them. You take care of them. If they don't, it's like they're two and, you know, they don't do what you say. And you're like, yeah, it's not that hard to deal with. They're two because you just pick them up and you move them. <laughs> it's harder when they're 16 and they've gotten bigger than you, <laughs> stronger than you. Now you need them to follow you and make the choice to submit to you. So during two to 16, you need to help them figure out why they should listen to you. Well, God doesn't just want us to be two forever. He doesn't just want us to be infants that He carries around forever. And I was thinking, kind of a side note, that that poem of, of the footprints, right? And I'm sure a lot of you have loved it, you know, the concept of somebody looking back on their life and they all the, the hardest parts of their life, they realized there were only one set of footprints in the sand. It's like, where did you go, God, all those difficult times in my life? He goes, well, I was carrying you. Those footprints are mine. And it's, a, it's kind of a neat poem that somebody wrote a long time. I think they, in recent years, have figured out who wrote it. But anyway, for a long time, it was anonymous. Um, but I think what God is actually trying to get us to do is to always have two sets of footprints even during the darkest times. 
So that even during the most difficult times, even through the hard times, we are walking with God and God is walking with us. And that we know that, God knows that, and that we are perfectly united together with Him in a very common path of, of life that we walk. And God wants us to be with Him and walk with Him. And He doesn't force us. He's not making us be two-year-olds that He forces us forever. And so He will give us and let us go. Just like as parents, at some point, you let them go. Like the father with you know, the, the two sons and the prodigal son. What did He do? He gave the prodigal son the stu- his, his inheritance and let him go off and, and waste it all. But then he was so happy when he came back. They threw a huge party because that's what he wanted. He wanted his son with him forever anyway. That's God. And that's what all of the Bible is really about. He wants to be with us. And he wants us to want to be with him. And so the second point, much of the scripture is about helping us learn to be like Him. Because He doesn't just want us with Him. He doesn't want us to be that, that unruly child walking with Him. You know, that He's... Con- you, ever, you know, you ever seen parents with kids, they're out in public, you know, wherever, at the, at the grocery store or something, and, they're, and it's like you just hear them for a few seconds and they're correcting them constantly. And, you know, I don't know if it's the parent's fault or the kid, <laughs> kid's just obnoxious and stiff-necked and stubborn, you know, both of those things are, can happen, and combination of the two can work into it as well. But he doesn't want that. He wants us to want to be together. But he also wants us to act like he acts, like he would act. And that's why he gave us his son and showed us his son. One of the reasons he gave us his son, showed us his son, explained what his son did and how he lived and how he acted so that we could understand And that we could conform to that, transform into that image. And I talked about all these last week, so I'm not really going to go over to these passages again. But then lastly, he wants us, he wants to glorify us. Just as Jesus talked about in in John 17, asking God to glorify him again as he had had been glorified with him before, He also wants to glorify us with Him as well. He wants us to be in His glory, to be in His brightness and be in His light. And He wants us to be in that glory as well so that we are raised up to a throne, to sit on the throne with His Son. Not to just be His servants, not to just be, you know, the people. I I remember somebody describing the con- why they hated the idea of heaven, that they thought, why would I want to go to heaven and be cleaning God's toenails? It's like, that's what you think of heaven? <laughs> Where did you get that image? <laughs> like, like, their concept of going up and becoming a slave or a servant that just sits in and, and you know, takes care of a pampered God. Like, where did you get that concept? Where did God ever teach you that that's what he does? That he sits back and waits for us to pamper him. That, that's not in Scripture. I'm not sure where you got that from. But that's not what he wants. He wants us to be in glory with him. He wants to glorify us. He wants us to have that victory over this flesh, over this world, over death. So that we have, don't worry and that we don't stress and that we have peace no matter what happens. I mean, we often talk about the peaceful nature in which Peter was sleeping the night before he expected to be crucified. I mean, that, that amazes most people when we read it. I mean, he's sleeping so soundly the angel has trouble waking him up. I wouldn't be able to sleep if I know you were killing me tomorrow. And killing me in a really gruesome, painful way. And unlike Jesus, not making sure I'm dead by the end of the day, but you know, crucifixions often lasted for days. People could hang on a cross for three, four, five, or more days dying. 
There was no guarantee Peter was just going to be dead in a little while. He was just going to start to be dead. That's what he would have thought. And there's no reason for him to necessarily think he wouldn't be killed. God already allowed James to be killed. And so, and yet he's sleeping soundly like a baby (laughs) because he has that peace that he wasn't worried about what happened to his flesh. Because he knew he wanted to be with God. And Jesus had promised, I'm going to come and bring you to me. And I'm going to prepare rooms for you. The place that I'm going to build. So God's grand purpose. I think all of Scripture really does hit at these three things. And so a lot of Scripture is both teaching us why we don't have fellowship and why and how we can and why we should. Both of these things. It's also what not to do and what to do in order to transform and be like His Son. And it's what glory isn't and what it is. It's both the positive and negative images of all of these things that I think Scripture is teaching us. Now, I started to look at a few passages I wanted to talk about this morning. And I said, it's interesting. I kind of went, I found, I was, and I was, I just searched for the phrase, my people. Because I started to think how often God says that. And he says that in the Old Testament somewhere around 200 times. So it's used a few other times amongst people. But most of the time it's a reference to God saying, my people, Israel. But I just looked at it, and and all throughout the Scripture, starting in Exodus, from the first 12 chapters of Exodus, where it occurs a lot, is talking about my people. And not only I want you to be my people, he said, but I, I want to be your God. Think about what those two things mean. For you, him to say, you're my people, it's more than just you're my offspring, right? You're with me. But it isn't just that you're with me. I want you to see me as with you. It is a relationship. It's not a one-way relationship. It is a two-way relationship. That we are His people and He is our God. Now, (coughs) as I started doing that, I found passages. And I went, wow, here's fellowship, transformation, and glory again. (laughs) That it all keeps coming back. And because I was just going to talk about fellowship today. And I went, you know what? These passages I keep looking at, they keep kind of bringing all of it in. And so, I want to start, though, with this passage. Because I think it's in Acts 17. Just, and I'm not going to read the whole thing because of time this morning. But I just want to highlight some of the things Paul said in this sermon in, in Acts 17. He is talking to a lot of philosophers in Greece in what is probably their most prestigious learning center. It's it's on Mars Hill. It's called the Areopagus. And so it's where the philosophers uh, probably went to really discuss deep thoughts, that that these philosophies that that many of the Greek uh, teachers had. And Paul had been asked, when he had been out teaching some things, they had asked him to come talk to them. And so he came and he began to talk to them about God. And he uses this phrase of, phrase of being God's offspring to them. I think this is one of the most important sermons in the book of Acts. Most of the other sermons recorded for us are the apostles talking to Jews specifically. Or to, you know, Cornelius. But this is one where he is talking to the whole world. And he mentions the fact of all nations and all people and all mankind. And God's intentions for all mankind. And so I think it's one of, for the rest of the world, I think this is one of the most important sermons recorded in the book of Acts. And so when he stood and talked with them, um, you know, and he talked and he, you know, he perceived they were really religious and he saw all the different statues and idols they had, which certainly bothered Paul because idolatry was not something he liked. But 
he saw the one to the unknown God. So they had, they had acknowledged there might be a God out there we don't know. And so he wanted to talk to them about that God that they didn't know. He wanted to help them know God. And, and so he said, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, I'm in verse 24, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands. And this really goes back to that idea, somebody's concept of going to heaven and being, you know, the official toenail cleaner for God. Uh, like, that's not what God is or doing. Not what he wants. Not what he's ever been about. And he says, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself, he himself gives to all mankind life. We don't live without God giving us life. We don't have breath without God allowing us to take a breath. We don't have anything without God having given us everything. And so sometimes people might go, well, yeah, God didn't give me, you know, my iPhone. Well, but God gave every element and mineral to, for us to form them into an iPhone. God gave us everything that we form to build stuff. Whether that's homes or electronics, whatever it might be, clothes. We didn't create the elements for any of these things. We don't make any of this happen. We just form stuff. And God is the one who has given us everything. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. So all mankind, lots of different nations, <coughs> but we're all connected to his one man that he started. And he says he has determined the allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places, talking about all these nations. God knows we're a lot of different nations of one mankind. And he's determined the, the, our edges, our boundaries, our times, and how long they go for. That, but this is the reason, and this is the verse, verse 27, that, this is the, re, for, the purpose for it, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Now, this word feel, sometimes could be talking about groping. And if you think about the idea of feeling your way or, or groping your way along something, doesn't it give you the impression that you can't see? That you can't see it? Because when do you have to feel your way? When you can't see with your eyes, right? It's too dark, you can't see well enough. And so we have to feel our way. Maybe you've been in a cave, maybe you've done some spelunking, and you realize that sometimes it gets so dark in there, if you turn the light off, or if your batteries go out, you're going to be feeling your way along the edge of that cave to get back out. And God has said that that's actually what all human beings have to do. We have to feel our way to find Him. But He has actually made all nations and all mankind in such a way that all of us can do that. And he says, because he says in this next verse, yet he is actually not far from each one of us. He's actually really close. And he's always been really close to all of us. He says, for in him we live and move and have our being. And, and even some of your own poets have said, for we indeed are his offspring. That's actually a quote from a poem, uh, of Greek, a Greek poem. Um, by Erastus. And so he's, Paul is actually quoting the Greeks, some of their own poets, to them. And he says, Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Now, when we think about repent, we think about often about feeling guilty. But you know, repentance doesn't mean feeling guilty. Guilt and shame can go along with repentance. It's often appropriate to go along with repentance. But repentance doesn't mean guilt. What it means is changing your path. Changing your way. That all of us, as we grow up, we find a way and a path in our life. And God is telling us that we all need to learn 
to change our ways that we have developed and follow God's ways so that we can walk side by side with Him, so that He can make His home with us. And so, He's telling us that all of us need to find a, that better way that we can change towards. Because He has fixed the day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom He has appointed. Obviously, Jesus. And so, He's telling us He wants us to find that better way. Because if we don't find the better way, there are consequences. There are consequences He doesn't want for us and we shouldn't want for us. Now, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 34, he told us about praying for people and for you know, uh, kings and authorities and people. He said, this is good and is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants, this is his desire, he wants to see everybody come to him. Just like any parent would. No matter what their children did, no matter how where they went, no matter how off they might travel, every parent wants those children to find their way back to goodness. No different than God. In fact, I would suggest to you all of that that's in us is in us because it's in God. And we were formed in His image. And so... Fellowship. I was going to look at Leviticus 26 and 1 through 3, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on all these passages. But today, in Leviticus 26 and 1 through 13, he's talking about not making idols and about obeying him, about walking in his statutes and observing his commandments in verse 3. And he says, Then I will give you your rains in their season, and the land shall yield its increase. It kind of reminded me of parents talking to their children and saying, listen, giving them chore list, right? If you do these things and you've done them all week, then you will get this. You will have this privilege. You will have this thing and I will give you maybe this money or I will let you do this. Or I will. That's what God is telling them. And he comes to the end of it in verse 12. I'll start probably in verse 11. I will make my dwelling among you and my soul shall not abhor you. Now, it's kind of an interesting thing. God's telling us He can abhor us. You know, we often talk about parents not always love their children. But it doesn't mean you always like them. You can certainly have children doing things you don't like. And if you don't, if you don't think that's true, how does God do that? God is certainly does that. There, we are all His offspring, and yet we do things God is certainly... He not only does not not like, He hates it. And He abhors it. It is distasteful and vulgar to Him. And, and children can sometimes go that way too, and, and it bothers us, right? Doesn't mean we don't love them. Just like God keeps loving us, and keeps giving us the things we need, and keeps asking us to change, and keeps doing the things to try and help us grow and be better. But we certainly can do things that God does not like. But he says if we will walk with Him and we will do and listen to Him, He won't abhor us. <laughs> That's kind of nice to know. <clears throat> and he says, I will walk among you and you will be, and will be your God. And you shall be my people. I am Yahweh, your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be slaves. That's his, what He wants for all of us. And the thing is, why would He allow them to be slaves as an image for us? Because slavery isn't about the physical slavery. As bad as that has been throughout human history, the much worse slavery has been the slavery to our own sins. The bondage we create being bound up in our sins because the consequences of that is eternal. It's not temporary. It doesn't end when the flesh ends. In fact, much of the problem really begins when the flesh ends, if we are bound up and enslaved to our temptations and our desires and our sin. 
And so He wants to be our God. And He wants us to be His people. And He said in Psalm 81, again, I'm not going to read the whole psalm. It's actually an incredible psalm titled, Oh, That My People Would Listen to Me. <laughs> Parents. How often as a parent have you thought, if, you, if you've been a parent long enough, and I'm putting everybody in this congregation has generally been parents long enough, you've had the thought, if they would only listen. <laughs> but no, they have to go figure, try to figure it out themselves and not listen. No, no, you're too old. You, you don't know anything. You're from a prior generation that was all stupid, and so we know, I know everything now. And every generation does that. Every generation growing up does that. Every generation of parents does, you know, has this same feeling. If they would only listen, they wouldn't have to keep, they wouldn't have to keep banging their head against the wall. But no, some of them feel like they want to bang their head against the wall for a while. And so he comes down, and I'll come down to the end of this in verse 11. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. By the way, you see this exact concept in Romans chapter 1, talking about giving them over to their desires. And he said, he tries to restrain us, he tries to stop us, but at a certain point you just let them go, which is exactly what parents do, isn't it? You can try and stop, you can try and teach, and you can try, no, don't do that, you try to correct, but at a certain point you go, well, you get too old, too big, too strong, and you go, well, okay, and you have to let them go. But he said, oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. So he isn't just, he's like, if you just would hear me, if you'd listen to me, then you could walk with me. You could do the things I would do. This is what he was telling Israel. Not much different than he's taught, telling us in Jesus. Now, and so the last one. If we overcome this world, we will receive His glory. But I want you to notice something in this passage. You're going to see also these other ideas we've already, I've already shared with you as well. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Now remember, John is giving, being given visions. And so after everything has happened through tw verse, chapter 20, he, we see he's being given a vision of a new heaven and earth. Okay? And he says, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea was no more. The sea, early in Revelation, by the way, separated God, the throne, from the people below it. There was a sea that came between them. And so he's telling us in this new creation, there is no sea between them. In what, in what the vision John is being given. And he says, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And so he saw this new and beautiful city of Jerusalem. And he, he says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. In fact, I started to think about it. In the very beginning of the book of Genesis, and in the very end of the book of Revelation, the both first book written and the very last book written, they begin and end with the image of God with His people. Because it is what He wants. And so He said to them, and God Himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, <laughs> nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, remember, he who is, who is seated on the throne? In chapter 4, it is the Lamb that, ascend, that rose and was placed upon the throne, who opened up all the seals that gives out all the visions. And he said, and so Jesus said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha 
and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. That, by the way, really ties into Isaiah chapter 55. It also ties into Jesus in the Gospels, talking about come to me as the living waters. And he says, the one who conquers, that term is sometimes translated overcome in some translations. It's the same word used to the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3, that to those who overcome, to those who conquer, I will give you know, to sit on my throne. I will give of the manna. I will give the white stone with a new name. I, all of those things that when we have overcome, when we have conquered, when we have overcome this world and this life and this death, that the, this is what we will receive. The one who conquers will have this heritage. This will be your inheritance. And he says, I will be his God And he will be my son. I'll stop there. The last verse, which is important, but it's telling us this isn't for those who, are, who don't grow to be courageous, who are cowardly, who don't grow to be faithful and trusting in God, but, be, but remain trustless in God, or who do detestable things that God abhors and continue in them, who who murder and hurt others and, are, and, and continue in sexual immorality and the practicing of, of idolatry and, and you know, the philosophies of this world and sorcery and in just deception and lies. Those who keep walking in those ways, he says, they won't have this heritage. That's the unfortunate part of the passage that talked about the time will come for a day of judgment. Right? Acts 17. Full circle again. The idea of the reason why we need to hear Him. Because there will be a time that we have to make, give an account. For did we feel our way and did we grope our way to really find Him? And did we, when we found Him, did we really grow in Him and did we transform and become like Him? To walk with Him. Not just know Him, not just know He exists, not just believe that He's there but to actually follow, to be a disciple of God's and to be His Son for all of us. We'll end there this morning. I appreciate your time. If you have needs, please reach out to any of the elders, the deacons, other members. If we can serve you, help you, we want to do that. If you're here today and we can help you in any way, please don't forget to reach out to us and seek help that you might continue to feel your way to finding God. We'll go ahead and sing uh, this song as, before we are close in prayer.
prayer. And then please be seated for announcements after that. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our good Father in heaven, we're so grateful to you. We're, <clears throat> excuse me, we're very thankful for this life that you blessed us with, Father. We're grateful for the truth that you give us in your word, Father. We're just grateful for that word, and we're so thankful. And we just pray that it would draw us nearer to you, Father, so that as we read it, we might see your face. We might uh, be encouraged to uh, live our life worthy of Christ Jesus, Father. Help us to take your word and just let it penetrate through our all, through all our being, Father, and may it encourage our hearts to love one another, to um, be good and to be kind. And um, Father, we thank you for your church and we're just grateful that we can come together and worship you in unity. And we're especially thankful for our Savior and the sacrifice that he made upon the cross for each of us. Father, we do ask your protection around each of us. We pray that you'll keep us safe and from harm. Be with our brothers and sisters that are traveling. Please keep them safe. For those that are at home that can't be here with us, Father, we pray that this pandemic would end soon and that we can all be together again, Father, in unity. Again, Father, we thank you for the blessings. We thank you for the life that we have in Christ Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Um, even under our current circumstances, our, our numbers are down. Um, it looks like there may be some people traveling that perhaps I didn't get uh, word of, but it's good to see everyone here. and and uh, hope that those that are at home are, are also, we thank you for being with us as well. Um, word on our sick, Lena still is uh, experiencing some difficulties with her recovery from her eye surgery. Um, wanna remember her, wanna remember Cindy, remember Julie as she, as they start her new treatments and remember her and the doctors that are are taking care of her. We do want to remember um, those that are working. Um, I, uh, Ryan and Kevin are deployed and we want to remember them, pray for their safety. Matt is up in Northern Idaho still with school. Um, those that are traveling, Jeremy is traveling and the Hastings are traveling. They're over in Mount Rushmore and and Jerry Jones is at a wedding in Harvard, Idaho, which I had to look up. I didn't know where, where that was, but that's definitely a few hours away. The Holmes are visiting their new granddaughter, so they're, they're not here with us as well. Um, there's many that are struggling with, with issues, things that are, are brought about by this pandemic, as well as other day-to-day -day issues that, that exist along with that. So. Do remember those that are having anxiety and depression issues. Um, these are trying times and we wanna, wanna reach out and encourage everyone that we can. As Roger had said, if there's any needs that anybody has, please reach out to the elders. We do have our, our email address is elders at boisechurchofchrist.org. Use it, we, we, the three of us see it, so. Um, it gets to all of us and that, that helps us to, to know how we can help you. Uh, want to encourage everyone to continue in your daily Bible reading and also continue in your daily prayer lives. Draw closer to God. The, the topics that Roger's bringing up, the, this thing about, about seeing, how the, seeing how scripture applies to us today, it still, still calls to us, we still learn from it want to uh, encourage everyone to check the bulletin board. There are things on there that, uh, that are good to know. And a uh, reminder of the ladies' lectureship. It's coming up this Saturday, or coming up Saturday, the 19th of September. And ladies, if you're planning to go, please let Roxy know that you'll be, 
that you plan to attend. Um, also, the ladies' Bible class, it will be uh, this Tuesday at 6.30 at Dondi's house. And then we will have our Hebrews class um, starting in about 10 or 15 minutes. So uh, I want to encourage everyone that can stay to, to do so and participate in that. Before we close, let's do have a, another prayer and then uh, we'll be dismissed. Shall we pray? Our Lord and our God, how awesome you are, for we know that all things have come about through you, through your creation and through the, through the many beauties that we see in this earth. We know that you've, you are great and we're, we're privileged to have you as our God. For not only are you powerful, but you're also loving and kind and merciful. We thank you for, the, for those blessings, for we know that through your Son we have a hope of an eternal life with you. We pray that you would be with us as we go throughout this life. Pray that you'd be with us in our times of joy and that we would remember you in our times of sorrow as well, for you are there. We ask that you would strengthen us, uplift us, and encourage us. We pray, Father, for those that we mentioned that are sick, facing physical struggles. We pray that you would be with them and, and help them and help them to to overcome things that, that are difficult and to find peace in you. We pray, Father, that you would be with those that, that choose to no longer follow you or those whose faith is weak. We pray that you would be with them. Pray that they would turn to you and that they would seek you out, that they would feel for you. For we know that sometimes our, our, our difficulties in this life cloud our vision and that all that we can do is reach out for you. We pray that we would reach and find you, that we would take the encouragement and, and the, the uplifting from one another, that we would help one another throughout this difficult life and during these difficult times. Help us to, to be the one that reaches out to help one another Pray that you would be with us, that we would also reach for that helping hand. We pray, Father, for our nation, for we know that there's times and trials that we are seeing that, that, that give us insecurities, that give us, give us pause and give us, give us discouragement. We pray that you would be with those that are in positions of authority in this land. We pray that the laws that they make would allow us to continue to worship you. We pray for your saints the world over, for we know that there are many that meet in your name that, are, that meet under fear of persecution. Be with them and give them strength. Be with us and give us strength that we would always stand for your word. We pray that you would give us courage to, to share your gospel message with those around us. For we know that it is your desire that all men would come to you. Help us to share that message so that they can. We thank you most of all for your son, Jesus, who came to this earth, who lived a perfect life, who showed us the way that, that is pleasing to you and who is willing to sacrifice his own life for our sins. For we know that there's no, no gift that we have that we can offer that brings us salvation, but only your son does. We pray that you'd be with us and that we would live lives that would bring honor and glory to your name that we would be the children of obedience, that would learn to learn your ways and to live those ways. We pray that you'd forgive us of our sins, for there are times that we do stumble, but we pray that we would always be lifted up, that we would continue on that path, that we would endure. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
So, let's pick up. We're in Hebrews, uh, the end of chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 11, is where we'll pick up this morning. And we're wrapping up the first section of the book. First section of the book is talking about the Son, and we're gonna we're gonna later on today we're gonna see how Jesus is named the Christ and the Son. So we see so we see that we're talking about Jesus, but how the Son is a better lawgiver um, than the prophets were, than angels were, uh, and then Moses was. But we're wrapping up a conversation about rest about the rest that was promised to the children of Israel as they came out of Egypt, that David in Psalm 95 is reminding them, you know, be diligent so you don't forsake this rest, so you don't lose this rest, like the Israelites coming out of Egypt lost it, and it's a reminder that the author is giving the recipients of this letter, hey, don't lose this rest. Verse, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 says, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. And we know that this rest is an eternity in heaven with God. That's that promised rest that, that uh, the writer is, is telling them. It's still there. It's still available. So in verse 11, he says, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So we're looking at those transition words in verse 11. We see, let us therefore, therefore, because that rest still remains, let us be diligent this reminder, this, this let us be diligent, sounds like what we're getting throughout this whole first few chapters of the book. Um, if we go back and look at the beginning of, you're moving the mouse around. If we look at the beginning of uh, chapter 2, let us give earnest heed in verse 1, lest we drift away. Um, verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect this salvation? So it's another reminder, another warning. We have this great thing don't mess it up. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. What's this example of disobedience that we've been looking at? Going back to Moses. Going back to Moses and how the children of Israel came out of Egypt, were disobedient, were untrusting of God, and therefore they didn't get what was promised to them. We've got to be diligent lest we fall into that same trap. Um, we see in verse 19 of chapter 3, they couldn't enter because of unbelief. So this, this lack of diligence really ties to unbelief. Now, when we see belief in this context, what's, what's another word that we can use? Trust. Or, so unbelief would be a lack of trust. So what we're seeing is, is they're not diligent because they don't trust. That's, that's the risk for us. That's the warning for us too. So then he talks about what the word of God is. So the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the divisions of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This is a dense verse. This is a really dense sentence. So let's break it out. What does it mean for the word of God to be living and powerful? Or living and active? Still applicable to our lives today. Okay. So, so, it's, oh, so it's still alive. It's still valuable. It's still worthwhile. Okay. Mark? A lot of what we see today is based around this idea or congregations that believe that there should be more modern interpretations based on what she just said that need to be reinterpreted for these times, the living word is applicable always and adaptable to whatever you're facing today and 2,000 years ago. Good. So it doesn't need to be updated or, or you know, reinterpreted or, or, or any changes made to it. Good. 
One of, the, one of the verses I really like is in Isaiah chapter 55, talking about the nature of the word. If we look at Isaiah chapter 55, and beginning in verse 10, we, we see a comparison here. For as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that they may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So the word of God, it's going to do what God intends it to do. It's going to accomplish what God intends it to accomplish. It's living, it's active, it's powerful, it's got, that's part of its inherent nature that it's going to do what God intends it to do. Um, what about it being sharper than, a, than, than any sword and piercing, well, so sharper, to, yeah, sharper than any two-edged sword. And, and the verse that pops to mind here is what we've looked at in the beginning of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, verse 37, that when the people in Jerusalem heard the word, they were cut to the heart. That word had this effect on them, had this impact on them. Roberta, did I see a hand? small minor things, nothing crazy, right? But um, but the, he made this point. He says the Bible may have some errors in it, the translations that we use, but it's infallible in that it has no soul for, to be put out and it will not come back for it. And I just, I'll never forget that because uh, it's just an interesting topic for another day, but, um, but that is a wonderful Yes, and, and I like that one. Um, but it's, I have to I have to comment. It's important to, to notice that we talk about there are there may be errors in translations. God's word is is a very different thing, right? But it is. But your point, it is going to accomplish. It's powerful. It's living. It's this active entity that God sends out, and it's going to do what He intends it to do. That that it it will not fail. Roger. The term for active here can also uh, mean effective. That the word is effective in doing, you know, uh, piercing to the soul and spirit intentions of the heart to kind of lay us open and, and really show us, you know, what we are. Right. What, let's let's look at that. Let's elaborate a little bit on what Roger mentioned. So it's it's living and active and powerful and sharper than a sword, and it pierces even to the division of soul and spirit. First of all, what's the difference between soul and spirit? I, I get some of this. Roberta laughed about it. I, I really like to know that. Well, let's look at. <laughs> Roberta wants to know it. Let's look at it. Let's look at, um, uh, I, I got the advantage. I'm a little more prepared. Uh, let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 in verse 23. We see, we see similar language there. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5 and uh, 23, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you and com sanctify you completely and may your whole Spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we've got, we've got three different things there, right? We've got a soul, and we've got a spirit, and we've got a body. Now, this back in Hebrews, in that verse, the word that we have for soul and the word that we have for uh, spirit are a little bit different. And again, not a Greek scholar, so I'm relying on other people. But, th but those, are, those are two different, slightly different words. The word that they have for soul sometimes gets translated life. And sometimes it gets translated as the eternal essence, the eternal spiritual essence that we have. 
and it's kind of up to the context to, to determine the difference there. Um, look at Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, verse 25, says, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That word life that we see twice in that verse is the same word that gets translated soul over in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. So, does it make sense to say in Matthew chapter 16, verse 25, for whoever desires to save his soul will lose his soul, and whoever loses his soul for, for my sake will find it? No, I think, it, I think it's that physical animal life. So when we, when we see that word soul, it can be the eternal spirit, but it can also be the, 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 the physical life. That sounds counter, that physical life that I have. But that animal life that I have in this world, just like my dog has animal life that we have in this world, just like your goldfish has animal life that we have in this world. So if we go back and look at Hebrews chapter 4, uh, chapter four verse 12, We've got a division of soul, animal life, and spirit. Now, this word spirit is what we saw over in uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, where it talks about the angels being ministering spirits, this, this spiritual life, the spiritual being. When we see in um, Matthew chapter 12, talking about unclean spirits, inhabiting a person that spirit word is the same word spirit that we have here um, in Matthew chapter 26 verse 41 where it says the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak that's the same word we have here so if you follow where I'm at this the word can differentiate between the thing that makes this body alive and the thing that will live forever either in God's presence or in punishment. Now, if you, if you take it the way I present it, is it? Yes, ma'am. And, and we all recognize this. At, at some point, this, this life, this, phys, this animal life that we have here is going to be over, but our spiritual life is going to continue. So, so, so that's my think so, that, that the word differentiates. Now, can we differentiate between this, this animal life that we have right now and the spiritual life? Can we point out where, where those things are separate? As breath, right, right. And both of these words actually have that similar root word in breath. But, but me as a man, can I identify the difference between animal life and spiritual life? Not, no, I can't see where that dividing thing is for me. And there have been tests that people have done where they weigh somebody before they die and they weigh somebody immediately after they die. And, and, and at the time, well, the human soul weighs like 0. .00000 whatever pounds. Now... If you disagree with me on that, that's fine. Because, Roberta, yeah, I disagree with you, and that's fine. There's a lot of disagreement on that. It's actually a complicated question. That's why I kind of give the light of me to be rude. No, no. I, you know, I don't take it as you being any ruder than typical. So, if... Coming from you? So, so, say you disagree with me on... on what soul is here and what spirit is here. That's fine. Is there a difference that God acknowledges between soul and spirit here? Even if we don't understand what it is. Yes, because he's telling us that his word 
can discern that difference. Now, whether we see it, whether we understand it, doesn't really matter, but his word does. And that's how effective, that's how sharp the word is, that it identifies that difference. And it can tell that difference. Dave, you had your hand up? Yeah, I was just kind of looking at it a little differently and changing that, the word out to Jesus. He is the word. Okay. He is alive. He is active. He can discern these things. And it says that in the next verse, he, or the bottom part of that verse, he, he discerns the thoughts and intentions. When you, it, it kind of makes that verse come more alive to me when I substitute Jesus in for that. Okay. And again, it's, 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 it's that same thought that, that God understands just down to the, the nth degree, the nth measurement of these differences. So, so Roger. Oh, um, I take this verse just a hair different way. One of the reasons I kind of say I don't really know the difference between soul and spirit, they're so similar, there might be, there might be some differences but I think the point of the verse is saying his word is so sharp that it can divide things you and I can't really easily figure out the difference between. Uh, because when you look at, uh, like, because he's really talking soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and thoughts and intentions are all essentially equivalent. So mm -hmm. it's so sharp it's divided between all these things. Joints and marrow. I mean, they're different, and you know, and surgeons. You know, most of us can couldn't divide between the joints and the marrow. You know, some good surgeons can. Um, but thoughts and intentions. Like, okay, well, what's the difference between me having a thought and me having an intention? Wow. Again, it's hard. How would you describe how different? I think the emphasis is on on how powerful God's word is in all of this verse. Right. That figuring out what these words mean, I don't know that it's nearly as important as understanding the power of this word. Right. And and that's a good point. And and we were gonna get there. I was just taking a longer way to get there. <laughs> but but can can you and me, me standing up here without a mask, can you see the difference in my soul and my spirit? No. Um Rod, we, we talked about there's there's a difference between joints and marrow, right? Those, those who studied medicine, I, I think, yeah. Now, me standing up here like I am right now, can you point out that difference? No. Now, my thoughts and my intentions. Me standing up here, can you identify the difference in my thoughts and intentions? No. no. But the word can. And the word does. So it's, a, it's, it, it's the word gets down inside of us and can tell that difference, can tell what really is this and what really is that. Now, if, if it can discern my thoughts and my intentions, can I fake my way through this? No, and that's the point. Remember, he's warning them, be diligent so you don't lose your rest because the word can tell the difference. I can fake it, I can put on a good face, I can put on a good show, but if I'm not really real, the word tells the difference. And then I'm at risk of losing that rest. And that's what this point is. And, and, and it builds on it in verse 13. And there's no creature hidden from his sight. Jonah can attest to this. Can we hide from God? Can we ever get away from, from what he's identifying, what, from what he's commanded, from what he's expected? And even if we look like we're doing okay, the word can tell the difference. So there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So what, is, what does the word naked mean? Bear. Sorry? Bear. Bear. We're exposed. There's, there's no hiding. Um, they, they make spanks so people can kind of hide. <laughs> and to be fair, they make men spanks. I think they're called manx. So people can hide what the truth of the situation is. If I'm naked, if I, if I typically wear spanks, which I don't, but if I typically <laughs> wear spanks, I could present myself as one way, but if I'm naked, you see the truth of the matter. I'm exposed. This is really what it is. 
Um, and then we have naked and we have open. This, this, this word open kind of has the idea of being laid open. So if someone dies for mysterious causes and we can't readily look at it, or we can't look at them and see what this person died from, what, what do we do? We have an autopsy. What does an autopsy do? It lays people open, literally. And you can see inside and you can, you can have a better insight of, oh, this is what's really going on because it's been laid open. Um, 16 years ago, Audrey started having abdominal pains. And, and they, they, they started a little in, uh, in, intermittent, I guess is the word that I want to use. They're there, then they're gone, then they're back, then they're gone. And then they get progressively worse and sharper and more painful. And looking at her from the outside, eh, you can't really see what's going on. Eh, you look fine. Um, and I finally convinced her to go to the doctor. And the doctor scanned her, said, oh, it's your appendix. You got to go in for surgery now. And, and we really went into surgery that day. Well, she did. I didn't. I was moral support. But they said, even after the scan, it's your appendix. We're going to go in laparoscopically. We're going to punch a little hole in you, and we're going to reach in and grab it and, and yank it out. And it'll take about an hour. After an hour, the anesthesiologist comes out and talks to me in the waiting room. Well, they encountered a little bit of extra problem. We're still dealing with it. She's fine. It's, it's just going to take a little longer than we thought. Another hour goes by, the anesthesiologist comes out and says, well, we, we encountered a little bit of unexpected stuff. She's fine. This is going to take a little longer than we thought. And after the third hour, I'm starting to, to freak out. Well, what happened is once they poked a hole in her and started looking, they realized that the things going on with the appendix was not originally what they thought the thing going on with the appendix was. So it wasn't until they sliced her open, laid her open, oh, this is what's really going on. And it was her appendix, but instead of her appendix bursting, her appendix started melting, both, both up the system and down the system. So they had to do additional surgery. But they didn't know what it was until she was laid open. And that's what the word does for us. There's no creature hidden. We're all exposed. We're all laid open to him whom we must give account. Now remember, this comes, this statement comes on the end of the warning, be diligent. Be diligent because there's no hiding. There's no faking. There's no deceiving. There's no copying off your neighbor. We have to be diligent. Now, is this, is this kind of a scary warning? Everything's exposed. There's no hiding anything. And this what ends the first section of the book. Everything is going to be seen. Be diligent because everything's out there. To him whom we must give account. Not only is it out there and seen, we have to defend it. We have to give an account of everything that's just laid open and exposed. So, any questions on the first, on, on the first section of the book? This is a transition point. I know it's not the end of a chapter. It should be the end of the chapter. This is a transition where we're finished talking about how the sun is a better lawgiver than the prophets, the sun is a better lawgiver than angels, and the sun is a better lawgiver than Moses. And we've got these warnings sprinkled throughout. Be careful that you don't lose that rest. Be diligent. Don't be negligent. So in chapter 4, verse 14, it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest, we've gone from don't neglect your salvation, don't mess up and lose this thing because you're going to be judged by the word. Now let's talk about the high priest. And this goes back to chapter 2 verse 17 where we first see Jesus as a high priest. But he says, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So, if I'm going to be exposed and laid open and have to give an account on that, is there anything I can do to really offset anything that I've already done? What, 
you said yes. I heard no over here. Oh, if I had to, if I had to be punished for everything I did wrong, I, it's a losing prospect, of course. But see, now there's no longer condemnation in Christ Jesus. Why? He paid the price for me. Which we saw in chapter two, verses seventeen and eighteen, that Jesus is that high priest who who made that propitiation for us. And remember, that propitiation word means he paid the price for us. Amen. So, so I'm going to be judged. What do I need? I need an advocate. I need a mediator. Verse 14, seeing then that we have this great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Now, we looked at this in, in the Acts class a little while ago. What does it mean that Jesus is this high priest who passed through the heavens? He's from them. He's from one of them. How many heavens do we see in verse 14? Yeah. So what are they? There's the atmosphere, then there's the stars in the universe, and then there's God's realm. Okay, yeah. So, so we've, got, we've got three heavens, and, and again, this is a little bit of review. We've spoken about this in a different class. Where the birds fly around is one heaven. Where the planets fly around is another heaven. And then God's realm is, is the other heaven. When did Jesus pass through the heavens? Okay. He made them. He made earth. He 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 made them. Dondi says when he came down. What and? When he went back. When he went back, and that's and that's what I'm thinking of is that's that's where our high priest passed through the heavens, when he when at the end of the Gospels where the disciples are watching him and they see him go up and they see him go up, at least into the first heaven. None of them. So we've got this, this great high priest. Now this, remember, this he, Hebrews reminds me of Romans, is that everything builds on something that came before. We've got this great high priest. We, we spent four chapters talking about how amazing the Son is, that he is God, that he is a creator of life, that he is a sustainer of life, and that for him all things exist. We've got this amazing being. Oh yeah, he's our high priest. That's a great high priest. So seeing that we have this great high priest, this great mediator, um, this great intercessor who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Again, review. What does confession mean? Sorry? Saying the same thing. Saying the same thing. Speaking the same as. What are we speaking the same thing as? What's the confession that we're holding tight to? That Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus is the Son of God and all the stuff that we looked at in the first four chapters applies to him. He's this incredible, amazing being. He is deity. If we're holding fast, if we're fastened on to that confession, that we're saying the same thing about him that we see written here, What's our behavior going to be? Yeah, Jesus is great and all, but I'm going to turn away from him and do this other thing. Are we holding fast to our confession then? No, we're denying the inherent nature of who he is. So, we've got this amazing person hold on tight to the truth of who he is. And then that's going to help us in our diligence. For we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So how is Jesus tempted? Every way we are. Every way we are. Does that sound a little bit weird to say? Think, no, nobody volunteer any information, but think about the ways that we're tempted. What, what you wrestle with, what I wrestle with, what we all wrestle with. Even if we don't 
read about it specifically in the Gospels, was Jesus tempted that way? It says that he was. So, so, he understands the temptation that we face. Now, he did it better than we did. But he understands the temptation that we face, and yet he's this high priest who understands God's perspective, who understands our perspective. Now, we just got finished looking at how the word is going to lay us open, how the word's going to expose us. But we've got this high priest who's this amazing entity, this, this incredible being, who is tempted like we are. So verse 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and grace to help in every time of need. What does the word grace mean? Unmerited favor. Okay. What's, so so it's, it's, it's something special that we don't deserve. What does mercy mean? Kind of the same thing. It, 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 it ties into forgiveness and, and kind of pity and, you know, I'm not going to exact true judgment on you. I'm going to have mercy on you. Mercy is to not give you what you are owed. Okay. Grace is a little bit more giving you, giving you things you haven't deserved. So it's giving a gift, something you haven't necessarily earned. Right. So, so what are we all similar? Slightly, one's not giving you what you should be get, should be getting, and the other one is giving you things you don't really deserve. Right, right. So, what based on what we just looked at about the word laying us open, and we got to give an account to all to all the stuff that's discovered there. Do we have to? Are, are we going to receive what we deserve based on what we've done in this life? No. no. Now. Are we going to get these beneficial, special things that we're really not entitled to anyway? Yes. Yeah. So we're not getting the bad, and we are getting the good, even though we deserve the bad and we don't deserve the good. That's this throne of mercy and, and receiving grace. Now, how do we approach it? It says with boldness, which is, you know, it's challenging because when you're... You know, when your parents come and discipline you as a child because you've done something wrong, do you get mercy from them on occasion? Often you do. You probably get more mercy than you you're, deserve. But do you ever deserve to stand before them uh, with boldness and say, I don't deserve to be punished for this thing I just did? I mean, that's what we're asking for is to stand, we're told to stand before God knowing that Christ intercedes for us and have that boldness. It's not a, it's not a, uh, I deserve this fullness. It's, I'm so thankful that I'm forgiven because of this sacrifice. Yeah. The type of fullness, you know. Yeah. Uh, Roberta and then uh, Rich. It does kind of remind me sometimes that you'll see um, really good Christians and they'll, you'll ask them if they're going to go to heaven and sometimes they'll say things like, I hope so, you know. Um, like, um, Sometimes they doubt grace, and it could be talking to the fact that you, you shouldn't doubt that. When you're in relationship, or as the word that, um, that Roger used in today, fellowship, when you're his child, you know that you're at the throne of grace, and you are saved, and you don't have to hope. In the, in the sense of, oh, you know, wringing your hands. Which, which so, so getting that confidence comes from? Growth. It comes from growth, but relationship. Yeah. The, but but who who tells us that we get these things? Who tells us that we don't have to worry about it? Okay. Do we believe him or do we not? Do we trust him or do yes. we not? And it's that growth and that trust and faith. Rich, and then I think Roger had a hand up. I I was going to say confidence. You know, there's boldness here is is almost like an overconfidence, and we need to have that confidence of what God says God will do. And that I think is the emphasis that he's making here is that we have this high priest that is that is going to bat for us. God is, Jesus has stepped in for us and so we should have confidence in his abilities to, to be there for us. Right. Right. Good. 
Right, and I was going to make mention the same point about I like ESV translated confidence better than uh, New King James kind of using boldness because we're not we're not being bold like oh I can I can do I can push my way in I have the right boldness has this kind of an implication that I can push my way in I have the right okay. confidence I think here plus it's not confidence in me it's confidence in Him so it's it's knowing some of the things I talked about this morning. Knowing he actually loves me, knowing he actually died for me, knowing he actually desires me to be with him, and knowing that he has said, I will help you if you come to me. <laughs> so knowing how much he loves me, my father, you know, that I've created his image, and that he wants to be with me, and he wants me to be with him, that's what gives me the confidence that I'm in trouble. It, it reminds me a little of, you know, I've seen this in, um, in, in some children, you see this. They get in big trouble, and, and in some families, children, they don't want to tell their parents. They're like, no, I'm, I'm gonna die. Um, and a lot of kids, you know, <laughs> you know, will think that. But then other, you see in some families, kids, they get in the worse of trouble, and even though they know mom or dad may not be real overly thrilled, they know they can talk to them. They absolutely know I can talk with them and they will help me. Right. You know, uh, after they've yelled at me. Right. <laughs> well, of course, the, the, the yelling is implicit. But, but that, I think that's, Rich and Roger made the point, that's, that's the key point, is we're looking at what we've done is being exposed by the word. Okay, we've, we've got to be diligent because what we've done is going to be shown. There's, there's no hiding it. But we still have that confidence because of this advocate that we have. Because of the Son who understands our point of view, who's at the right hand of the throne of God, understands God's point of view, but he's there making intercession for us. He's there on our behalf. And it's because of him we have confidence. Because we know We've got him in our corner. Dave? I was just thinking of the, the story of the prodigal son. He, he comes to that conclusion. I can go back to my dad, and he's going to take me. Right. But, you know, and he knows he's not deserving. Right. You know, I'm, I'm not deserving, and I'm going to tell him that. I'm not deserving to make me as one of your higher helpers. Right. But he had the confidence knowing that his dad would at least do that for him, for sure. He goes yeah. back. Yes, ma'am. I don't think that uh, everything we did before we were forgiven uh, will be exposed it's because I've been forgiven. Before you accepted Christ, we did some bad things and then they are no longer held against us. Right. Right. And there's and there's two aspects of that. Remember, we're forgiven and the price has been paid. So there's there's two big things that, that wipe that away from us. We, we have been forgiven and the propitiation was made. Now one quick point and then, and then we'll end. We're going a little bit over where I wanted to, to go. The high priests in the Old Testament, did they make intercession for the people? Yes. Yeah. And we'll look at this more next week. How often did they do that? Once a year. Once a year. They... they killed the goat, and they put the blood in the bowl, and they went into the Holy of Holies where the where the mercy seat, where the propitiation was, and they flipped blood on the thing once a year. Verse 16, let us come boldly so we can obtain mercy and grace. When? Every time we need it. That's the presence that our high priest has before God. Not, not once a year. Every time we need it, every single time, our high priest is making that intercession for us. That should help give us that confidence that we're supposed to have. All right, we'll pick up in chapter 5, verse 1, next week. Remember, we're in a whole new section of the book now talking about Christ as our high priest, or the Son as our high priest. And we picked it up in chapter 4, verse 14, and we'll go all the way through chapter 10, uh, where we're talking about him as our high priest and, and what the implications of that are. Uh, anything else before we break?
Let's have a quick prayer and we'll, and we'll be done. Our Father, we humbly come to you, thank you for this chance to study your word, and we know the power that your word has. We ask that we would be diligent and careful in our study of it, that your truth be taught, and that we would trust the things that you give us so that we can have this boldness, that we can have this expectation of the rest that you've promised us. Please help us as, as we go through this life to help one another to understand your word more, to be more faithful in how we live. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Thank you.